would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work, the Gundagara land and people. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I also want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which you, our listeners, are joining us from today. I recognise the deep connection that First Nations people have to this land, their enduring culture and their commitment to the preservation and care for their country. This land was never ceded, and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Hey there, and welcome to Beyond the Surface, the podcast where we explore the stories of people who have survived religious trauma, left high control or cult communities, and are deconstructing their faith. I'm your host, Sam, and each week I'll talk with individuals who have taken the brave step to start shifting their beliefs that might have once controlled and defined their lives. Join us as we dig into their experiences, the challenges they've faced, and the insights they've gained. Whether you're on a similar journey or you're just curious about these powerful stories, you're in the right place. This is Beyond the Surface. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. I have just finished devouring your book this week. Oh, um, thank you. And it was it. It is honestly just wonderful. It really is. Um, Thank you so much. It is just a really, you, I, you know, and I think you sort of mentioned this when I first reached out about you joining on the podcast, um, which is, you know, there is a lot of pain and a lot of trauma and a lot of hurt um, for a lot of people that I'm talking with. Um, but you described your journey as more intellectual and mm -hmm. um, and I love that because, you know, I think, it, you know, the diversity in the deconstruction world is vast mm -hmm. and, um, but the way that you articulated it through the book was just beautiful. Um, oh, thank you yeah, so much. It's really lovely. So for people who don't know, where does your story start? Yes, sure. So I would say for me, my faith story starts at the very beginning because I was born to Christian parents okay. who were themselves a bit uh, later in life converts. They had done the whole born again thing as they were getting married and mm -hmm. starting to have a family. I'm the oldest. Um, and so they were kind of in the fresh fervor of new converts and wanted to do it all right and raise their kids to love the Lord and so we were at church every single Sunday. I did. We have a thing in the States called Awanas, which is like a children's uh, ministry where you meet on a weeknight and you memorize verses and play Bible themed games. And it's like a wow. kid's fun zone, but religious based. Yeah. Uh, so I did that for years. I was in youth group. I led Bible studies, you know, all of it. So I was, my faith was just a part of who I was in a very core, very central part of my identity. Um, I thought of myself and I was taught to be first and foremost a Christian before I was even my own self. You know, I was supposed to be dead to Christ and it's Christ who lives in you. And mm -hmm. I, I understood that and I was on board and yeah, you mentioned, you know, kind of the pain and trauma. I feel very fortunate that my religious upbringing was fairly undramatic. It was fairly healthy. I mean, I still of course have some shame complexes and there was some unhealthy lessons that I got from my faith purity culture affected us all um but i didn't have any specific horrible experiences like i know so many people have mm -hmm. i happen to be cisgender i happen to be straight so i didn't have to be closeted or deal with any pain of of that kind mm -hmm. um and so the faith of my youth was lovely i really loved god and i really felt loved by god god gave me an identity and purpose and value and really molded me in ways that I am still glad, you know, grateful for. I'm glad to be the way I am. And I credit a lot of that to my religious upbringing. Mm. Um, so it made it extra hard to leave because I wasn't planning on leaving. I wasn't intending yeah. to leave. And when it all eventually did fall apart and I could no longer believe in the concept of God, mm. uh, it was really painful. It was a grief. You know, someone had died. It was really hard. So that's where the trauma came in, I guess. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, the it's, I feel like it's almost 
worse than someone dying because mm-hmm. that's, you know, very, you know, it's a stock standard response when someone dies is that you grieve um, and mm-hmm. it's, you know, I guess a socially, I, when I talk about emotion, grief is one of those things that I describe as it's like socially acceptable emotion. And and yet this, you know, God was more than a person. You right. Know, well, it, it was for me, it was part of my identity. It was, you know, completely interwoven and connected. Mm-hmm. So I would imagine that that grief was, was you know, much more ritualistic. Yeah. Um, what was, how did it come about in terms of, you know, I obviously know a few, the things that you've written in the book, but what was that process like for you when you started to question things, things started to unravel? Yeah. So it was a really slow boil for Mm. me. It was not a sudden shift. Um, and at the time, again, it did not feel like it was leading toward where I have landed in this agnostic atheist space. Mm. Um, so for the longest time, it just felt like I was growing and maturing in my faith and getting into the meat and not the milk, as the yeah. verse says. And so uh, my faith evolved uh, as I grew and had experiences with people and places around the world. I was very, very lucky to get to go to Australia during yeah. college. And- Spent five months outside of Melbourne. Yeah. And I loved every minute there. And I met a lot of wonderful people on campus that were Muslim. And, you know, that was a little chip or a little loose thread in the sweater of, huh, these folks sound just like me. Yeah. They believe as strongly as I do. It their faith guides their life to the extent mine does. They quote their Bible, their Quran the way I quote the Bible. Um so that really threw me and kind of opened me up into a little bit more of a universal sort of space. Um, meeting my first openly gay friend really threw that under the microscope of, huh, mm-hmm. he seems lovely and fine. Why is his very nature wrong and sinful? I don't get that. Yeah. That led me to question and read books and watch documentaries and change. So it was all very organic and just natural, just through life and and having experiences and meeting people. And I am a reader and I've always taken my faith very seriously, which meant I've read the Bible cover to cover, but I've also read tons of devotionals and books about the Bible and books about Jesus. And as I learned more, um, it actually opened up a lot of questions the more I dug into things and I just ruminated on stuff. I just, I, I really tried to live into my faith and be dwelling on the words um, of the Lord constantly. And so eventually those raised questions and and some doubts sprung up. So it was a very slow process, probably really the last 15, 20 years this has been coming. And again, I didn't at the time just thought my faith's just expanding and growing. Um, Mm. But there was a more pivotal shift that pushed me into this foreign land that I'm now in of atheism where um, it was during the twilight zone of the pandemic, kind of early pandemic days where we're all, everything's closed. We're all stuck in our homes. You know, you weren't seeing anybody or going anywhere. I had been laid off. I'm a physiotherapist by day mm-hmm. and folks were afraid to go and exercise in gyms with other people. So a lot of us got laid off at the beginning of the pandemic um, and no one was hiring for a while. So I'm just home with the kids who were very little and not able to talk to me a lot still at that point. And so I was in my head. I had a lot of time to think. Yeah. Uh, and especially in America at the same time, we had the murder of George Floyd at the hands of one of our police officers. And that brought up a whole lot of racial tension that had been always there under the surface. It all bubbled up. And mm. so this, this idea of, racism and evil and suffering was very, you know, front of mind. Yeah. And it was ultimately those questions as I pondered the world that we have, the world that I can see with my eyes and know, despite my very privileged experience as a cisgender straight white woman, Mm. uh, other people's worlds are very different and are very challenging and painful and especially going back in time and thinking about you yeah. know people born enslaved and just all kinds of ways that humans have suffered horrifically on this planet to think why would god make it this way if they were mm-hmm. all powerful and could have done anything um 
And ultimately to me, it felt more true and more almost comforting to think maybe God didn't, maybe there isn't a God. Maybe we're just here because we're here and it's just all science and yeah. byproduct of evolution. That actually felt better to me than to think someone did this this way on purpose. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting because as you talk, I have in my head that, you know, it was intellectual, but I don't, I mean, yes, there's intellect there, but <laughs> what I hear is empathy, really. You mm. know, it was empathy towards, you know, people of other faiths and other genders and sexuality and empathy towards wanting racial justice. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I know that you talk a bit in the book about climate change as well and mm -hmm. and so whilst yes intellectual it's also <laughs> empathetic though sure your heart was what started that it sounds like yeah definitely it was uh fueled by my heart but processed yeah. in my brain because it yeah. yeah it wasn't necessarily my particular story but yeah the awareness mm. of others so yeah that's true <laughs> mm. and so what was it like for you to start I guess, considering that this God that you had devoted your life to mm -hmm. was potentially not real. It was scary. I think I wouldn't even let myself go there yeah. and even ask that question in my head for a long time. Mm. You know, I talk to other people now that I've met and on this path and a lot of people in my life are still Christians, a lot of my friends and the area where I live is a very religious uh, town. And so the assumption is anybody you're talking to is most likely at least in name a Christian. Um, and as my book comes up or I'm having some of these more conversations, a lot of people say, well, yeah, when I was a kid, I wondered if God was really real. I had never wondered that. I had oh, never man. asked, could God be a made up thing? Mm -hmm. I think protectively my brain threw up a barrier of like, don't go there because you need this to be real. You have dedicated your whole life to it, as you said. Yeah. Uh, and so it felt very scary to even formulate the question. Um, I just remember my heart pounding and, you know, just feeling so anxious to even think it. And I knew if I, I think part of my fear was that I was starting to lean after I had been growing and learning so much, I kind of knew what I thought the answer was going to be if I let myself ask. So I was afraid to ask the question because I was afraid of the answer that I was leaning toward because yeah. I knew that would rock my whole world. My husband is a Christian. Our children have been raised going to church. Almost mm -hmm. all of our friends are believers, you know? So yeah. I just knew it would rip the rug out from under everything. Um, so there was a lot of fear in that. But then shockingly, when I did ask it and said out loud to my own ears only, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think something's out there or at least nothing remotely close to the thing I've been taught about growing up to where I wouldn't feel comfortable using the word God. It would have to be something so completely different. Yeah. New word needed. Um, when I admitted that to myself, I felt such a profound sense of peace mm. because that cognitive dissonance just melted away and I didn't have to try to figure out how this is possible and try to defend God for letting all these horrible things happen. So on a personal level, it felt so right. And I felt very calm saying it out loud, but then the anxiety and fear was still the fallout. And what is this going to do to my life? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because I guess, you know, many of us were under the assumption being in churches that you don't ask questions because questions mm -hmm. signified <laughs> doubt or that, you know, if you ask the wrong question, it could lead you down the wrong path or, you know, those sorts mm -hmm. of things. Um, and I so they're right. Whoops. Yeah, <laughs> I know we're probably proving their point. Um, <laughs> but um, what was that like in terms of, you know, your family? Yeah. I mean, none of them are thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> My parents are also believers and um, they have read the book. My husband read um, he read a version of the book. I don't know if he's read the final edited copy that's published. I think mm -hmm. he was close to that version. Um, yeah, no, I think it freaked everybody out. Um, 
thankfully I have people in my life that are able to hold two things at once. You know, they're able to not agree with where I'm at and not be thrilled about it, but still love me and, and want me in their life. And so nobody ended a relationship. This didn't sever any cords. I'm sure there are people that I had known in my younger years Mm. when I was in a more closed minded space of faith that would write me off now, but we've long since lost touch. The church I've been going to for the last decade plus is a very progressive, open-minded church. Mm -hmm. They're open and affirming. We have female preachers and elders. We have scientists come do lectures or sermons on Sunday service. They've done sermon series on doubt and encouraged doubt and talked about how important it is. And God can handle it. If God is there, they're big enough to handle our little questions, you know? Mm. So no one was too scandalized. Um, Even my own pastor, I talk about him in the book a little bit. Mm. He helped me process a lot of this as it was happening. We met up in the pandemic a couple of times for, you know, social distance walks <laughs> yeah. so fired on the sidewalk. And he knew everything I was thinking and didn't, you know, say you're gone. You can't come to church anymore. You know, he was very encouraging. He even has been helping promote the book and he got me some more writing gigs and has been like a supporter. <laughs> so okay. he's not only not threatened, but he's encouraging people to read. He bought the book for the whole elder team to read and said like, this is a trend, you know, a lot of people are leaving religion and leaving faith. So let's use her story to understand how this happens and, and better understand these folks. So I feel extremely, extremely lucky and fortunate in that sense that nobody has written me off over all this, but yeah, my, my parents aren't excited and my husband, it's been painful for him. You know, he's hurt. It feels like a bit of a betrayal because we would have both never married someone who wasn't a Christian. Yeah. And now he finds himself married to someone who doesn't believe in God. So I can't really be a Christian either. So yeah. It's um new territory for us. Um so we're yeah. we're working through that still. Yeah. And I would imagine, I mean, I'm sitting in my couples therapy brain just turned on for a <laughs> second and went, you know, I mixed faith uh relationships in general are hard let alone when that mixed faith comes out of the blue almost um or mm-hmm. not from the beginning um mm-hmm. and so um i i would be expecting that to be a slow fade as well um yes. in terms of that slow healing but mm-hmm. um when i talk about healing i often say slow is fast because anything that mm-hmm. is done fast is not always done well i wasn't yeah <laughs> um yeah okay i i want to circle back because i remember when i read this i thought oh i could never which is you still go to church yeah. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about that because I read that and I thought, I mean, and obviously different experiences, but um, mm-hmm. the thought of of sitting in a church service, particularly the service, you know, the church that I was a part of, um, makes me feel physically nauseous. Um, <laughs> so I'm sitting here and I'm going, oh, the inner strength of this woman. Like, how? <laughs> how are you doing that every week? Well, it's not every week. We have okay. young kids who get sick every other week. So yes. it's definitely not that consistent right now and hadn't been for a while. Um, uh, yeah. Well, as I just kind of described, my church is pretty special. So mm-hmm. they're not a bunch of closed minded, you know, they're a special group. Mm. And so they aren't giving me dirty looks or, you know, whispering behind their hands when I walk in the door. Yeah. Uh, quite a few people at church have read my book. I haven't really gotten to discuss that with any of them. So I would be kind of curious what they think. But at the same time, I don't really care or want to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, But yeah, so it's to the credit of my church and how great they are, for one thing. Mm. Um, And the reason I'm going, if I was just my own person, unattached, without relationships I would probably not be going yeah. I would actually be kind of curious to try some other spaces out and we have a Buddhist temple in town I'd be curious to go to you know we have a Unitarian Universalist church I w- would be exploring those more likely but I am married and my husband is still a believer and we had been raising our ch- kids going to Sunday school there and so I've already 
thrown a bomb in our marriage. I just felt like I didn't want to rock the boat too hard and change our entire weekly schedule as well. So um, I'm going as a bit of an olive branch, you know, for my husband. And because my church is so good, I'm not really worried about them messing up my kids. They're not teaching dogmas or beliefs that I'm going to feel like I'm going to have to erase down the road. Uh, Even the whole theme of our kids community is I wonder. Mm. So they're not about preaching. This is the right stuff. And we have all these answers that are always approaching things from a, Oh, what does that sound like to you? Or, you know, what do you think about this? And I don't know, maybe that could, you know, so they're very open-ended, which I love Mm. um, because they don't want, they've done a sermon on, how much we had had to all deconstruct as we learn unavoidable truths, you know, science comes in the picture. You think about evolution. So Mm. they don't want to have all of our kids have these, these stumbling blocks that could cause them to completely leave the faith Mm. and are trying to head those off by just being more honest and authentic from the get go and more willing to admit what they don't know. So yeah, it's a it's a pretty good place to be. There are certainly weeks though that it's hard to be there. Um, I kind of tune out during all the singing. I was never a big singer, and that was not my favorite part of the surface anyway. And I find the lyrics can be triggering for me. Mm. Those are harder for me. So I just my little guy, he's five. He doesn't like Sunday school, so he always sits with us. So he's a great distraction because then we're coloring <laughs> and he's asking, you know, bugging me and asking me questions. Yeah, so I what just, is the snacks? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that first thing he wants when we sit down. So I just let him distract me and kind of be my little buddy during that time. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, week to week, it varies what the message is. And there have been weeks where where the main point of the sermon is still a life lesson that mm-hmm. I can benefit from, you know, for me, the, the reasoning behind maybe why to lean into gratitude or generosity or hospitality or whatever they're talking about isn't to please God up in the sky, but I still think those are good ways to be a human. So I just try to reconceptualize um, the sermon as I'm hearing it, or I kind of use it as a, a check, you know, okay, what do I think about that? Does that still sound wrong to me? Because I try to, I am agnostic. I'm trying to stay truly open-minded. So I analyze and I help it sharpen my thoughts and beliefs, even if I'm criticizing everything they're saying. That also can feel like, okay, I guess I really do, you know, disagree. And I really think what I think right now. Yeah, Um, because I would imagine there would be times where it's actually really reinforcing of, you know, the exploration that you've already done. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, for sure. A recent sermon was a harder one to sit through because it was harping on God as <clears throat> sovereign and all powerful mm-hmm. and just kept talking about how God can do anything. And I'm thinking, well, then God's a giant asshole because yeah. they're not doing a whole lot to help a bunch of people yeah. looking at Ukraine and Gaza and just, you know, all kids with cancer, just a hundred examples you could easily come up with of mm. where is God and they're okay watching that happen. So yeah, that one was tough to sit through. Like, mm-hmm. that's yeah. why I walked away. Because if God is, as you are saying right now, that powerful, then I've got some problems. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it goes back to, um, I think I commented on one of your posts today about your chapter <laughs> titled "Free Will," where I basically mm. went through every human emotion possible in that <laughs> chapter. Um, because, you know, you do say in there, like, if the, if there is a God and he is allowing this to happen, that's not a God that demands my worship. That's not somebody Mm -hmm. that I want to have anything to do with. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think that concept of where is God in suffering and in pain is often, I guess, that, that clincher for a lot of people, Mm -hmm. um, because and I used to explain yeah. that away so tidily with I know. Free will. Yeah. Like God has to protect free will. Otherwise, we're all puppets. So they have to give us that power. Mm. Therefore, people make good and bad choices. The bad choices domino and hurt us all. Yeah. That was a very easy way to get God off the hook. And it worked in my mind for a long time. Mm. But as I started to question free will, both from a philosophical point of view, which is very interesting, and there's more and more 
talks, you know, that's entering the zeitgeist a lot more now of questioning of free will. There's a book by, I don't know if you know, Robert Sapolsky. He wrote that uh, zebras don't get ulcers or a book, something like that. He has a new one out oh. all about free will. Right. And that uh, sounds fascinating. I heard him on a podcast. Um, and so, yeah, just thinking about free will from an, uh, an actuality, if, mm -hmm. if this is really a phenomenon that exists or not, if we just think it does. <laughs> yeah. um, but even if it does exist, questioning the practicality of it. Okay, if we have the free will, it's being hoarded by, you know, the rich and powerful, truly. And they are playing dominoes, playing chess with the rest of our lives. Yeah, They are making the world not a world I want to live in with the climate change, pollution. You know, I don't have the free will to stop that from happening. I don't have the free will to eat food that's grown out of good soil that hasn't been depleted by, you know, mass farming practices. Mm -hmm. I don't have free will left and right. I don't have free will to buy clothes that were ethically made because it's yeah. really hard to even do that research or check into that. There's so many ways that my free will is limited, let alone, again, thinking of that person born enslaved. Mm. They didn't have the free will to eat when they wanted to eat and how much. They didn't have the free will to marry, to keep their babies, you know. Um, so if free will is already that constrained and that controlled, then it kind of mm. takes the excuse out of it. If that was the big get out of jail free pass for God, but in actuality, most of us aren't getting to use our free will then it felt like, okay, that excuse isn't going to work anymore. Yeah. Yeah. What else you got for me, essentially? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. What was mm -hmm. it like for you trying to reconcile your emotional love for God with all of the new intellectual information that you're getting? Yeah, that was the anxiety piece. That was yeah. the fear because yeah. I had loved this God and felt known and felt loved. I remember I have journals after journals filled with prayers and what is it with times. Christians and journals? I tell you, everyone. We were told oh, this is what a good Christian does. I know, I know I'm the time. same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I thought, gosh, was I just talking to the wall? But then I thought, you know what? If no one ever was listening, then my own head brought me a lot of clarity and relief. Just writing it out must have been therapeutic all by itself. So yeah. it's almost comforting to go back and imagine a world without God this whole time and say, okay, well, then I still got through all that tough stuff on my own. You know, maybe it was a placebo effect I needed, but uh, if God was never there, well, I've still survived a lot of the things I've survived and, you know, gotten through life on my own two feet, I guess, and with the help of my community and friends and family and et cetera. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a deep uh, sense of loneliness though, for sure. When I kind of let go of that idea. And I think I talked about in the book, the very first night that I just laid down and started to pray on autopilot yeah. just crushed me. I started weeping thinking, oh, I don't think anyone's listening. And I have done this, you know, for my whole life, I've been talking to the ceiling mm. and to think that it's no one's hearing my thoughts that that felt very lonely. Um, the first time I'm a huge nature lover. And the first time I saw a really beautiful scene outside of nature, and I always would have been praise God, thank you, God, your hands are so wonderful. You created this glorious world. Now to think, Oh, Oh, I don't have anyone to thank. Oh gosh. But then at the same time thinking, okay, well, it's still beautiful. I'm still looking at something really pretty yeah. with or without God. I can just appreciate the beauty for what it is, you know? So as things came up, I kind of had to process on the fly and mm. I am a naturally optimistic person. So I can find those silver linings pretty fast, mm -hmm. um, which helps, but yeah, it's, it's a whole new world, like literally, because God yeah. is a factor in every piece of my world. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I is there, because often when I talk to people who uh, were all in, I guess, most of the people that I'm talking to were all in, they're not the lukewarm people who just right. went every now and then. Um, but there was almost like a needing to reintegrate into society as, you know, mm -hmm. as outside of the church. Was there any of that for you in terms of reintegration without this 
underpinning belief that you always had? I think that has had to be solo for me yeah. um, because my community is still so religious mm. across the board. I have had to just do a lot of that in my head as yeah. I go through my day to day. So, cause yeah, I'm still going to church, you know, our yeah. friends are still pretty much believers and they like to talk about things and they're not threatened by having me being real and, you know, saying what I really think. Um, but it's definitely kind of a elephant in the room. You know, now the conversations don't flow quite the same. Mm -hmm. We just end up talking about other stuff, which there's plenty in American politics to be talking about all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, that reintegration, I think, has been the loneliest part because i that's why I wrote the book because I felt so alone. I was the only person in my life who had made this decision and had done this, and I couldn't find a lot of other people like me. And I looked for some books, and I couldn't find a lot of books that had completely walked away. You know, a lot of the progressive Christian voices questioned a lot of things, mm. but still held on to an idea of the divine or of God. And here I was really thinking that even that was out of the picture. So yeah. that's why I wrote my book was to find other people like you guys. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it's like double sense of loneliness, right? Because mm -hmm. you're not just doing this work on your own, but you're now that there's no belief in God, there's that inner feeling of being alone. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of loneliness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I and I have been asking most people about, I guess, where their sense of spirituality is now. And um, and you said that you're a huge nature lover, which having mm. just devoured your book, I would say is an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> um, because the way um my personal therapist is a forest therapist, and oh. um, and so I'm actually going, yeah, he would love your book because. <laughs> If he can bring nature into every conversation, he will. Um, and as one should, the, yeah. <laughs> and as I'm reading, I'm thinking the way that you talk about nature is spiritual. Mm -hmm. I mean, in itself, the you know the way that you describe it and the way that you almost um, interact with nature has a mm -hmm. spiritual element to it. Mm -hmm. um, is nature a big part of that for you? Oh, certainly. And it's funny because the reason I feel such a connection to nature and have these moments of transcendence where I feel like I am at one with all these other living beings, animals and trees included, everything, is because of science. It's totally secular why I feel that way. Mm. I did not learn about evolution until I was an adult because <laughs> mm. that was wrong and I wasn't supposed to. So I blocked my ears in school and I refused to learn about it. And I fled to the Christian history teacher at my high school and said, give me ammunition to debate my anthropology teacher. Yeah. So I did not learn evolution for a long time. And yeah. again, thankfully, I'm a reader and I'm curious. And so I had picked up some books on paleoanthropology and learning about specifically human evolution way, way back to like our common ancestor with the ape days mm. was so fascinating to me. Mm. And just to think about that, that tree of life, these branches that we all started off, you know, the very first living single celled organism is mm. the great, 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 great grandmother of everything on this planet. Everything started at one point in time, which is bananas and still very mysterious to think about. Mm. Um, and, you know, plants were one branch, animals another, blah, blah, blah. So I feel literally connected to everything mm. in the universe and on the earth now and knowing about, you know, the <clears throat> kind of science of our, our cells and electrons, like the quantum stuff, how our, our electrons are both in our cells and our body. And at the same time, the probabilities, you know, they're here, but they're also everywhere. So an, an electron from a cell in my body could be on a different galaxy right now, or could be in you right now, or be part of the computer processor right now. We are blending our very cellular makeup with everything around us at all times, just yeah. literally connected. And so to me, that's so beautiful and profound mm -hmm. and totally secular, doesn't need any. So spirituality is a little tricky word because I'm fairly 
um, naturalist. You know, I don't know. I kind I don't know. There's some definitely weird, inexplicable things with near death yeah. experiences and past life kind of stuff. But it's that would be really hard for me to to land on that side. I I lean towards it's lights out. We're done. The physical yeah. world is the only world. Um, who knows? And it'd be great to find out that I'm wrong and that there's something else after this that's lovely for everyone. But I don't know. Yeah. Um, so I have a pretty hardcore secular worldview. Mm. And yet it feels very, yeah, spiritual, quote unquote, Yeah, in that yeah. sense. But spiritual implies another realm, you know, a spiritual world on top of the physical world. And mm. I don't know that I t- technically agree with that. So semantics, mm. but, but yeah, yeah I, get I mean, sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, and, and I guess spiritual is the, is the term that I would use, but um, I guess it is just, um, I use the term spiritual in, in the sense of like an inner connection almost. Mm-hmm. Um, and that and sense so, of like, awe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you look back on, uh, your time in the church as a Christian? <laughs> How do I look back? Um, yeah. I don't, you know, I, I see a lot of memes of people talking about like, give me my tithe money back or all those mm-hmm. hours I spent and yeah. I get that. Um, I guess I don't have a ton of regret. I feel a lot of empathy toward my old self. I believed that because it was in the air I was breathing. I was raised without it really having again free will being a choice I was a Christian because my parents were Christian and it was my life Mm. um so I don't beat myself up or feel like I was dumb or duped or anything like that it's like well of course I was a Christian if I had been born in another country I most likely would have been a Muslim you know Mm. so much of who we are is circumstantial based on our context yeah Um, so I don't feel any sense of like uh, shame or disappointment with myself for not having figured it out sooner or anything like that. It's a journey. And I, my husband, you know, one thing that we'll talk about for him, it's very compelling that humans, even way back to pre homo sapien, like Neanderthal days have had a sense of spirituality, have had the understanding or assumption that there is something else out there, that there are these divine things, whether that was animism and in nature at the time, you know, but we have had that, that compulsion to believe in something greater from the very beginning. So to him, that's Mm. evidence that there is something, you know, if every single human has always thought going back in time, which is not true every single, and you can find ancient Greeks who are atheist and, you know, it's not always everyone everywhere, but um, yeah, to him, it's, it feels almost arrogant for me to be like, yeah, no, every single human society has been wrong. I'm yeah. right. And there is nothing out there. Um, so I, there's reasons why we all have these spiritual ideas and religious thoughts and I don't want to discredit or throw it all under the bus. You know, I mm-hmm. think it's been part of the human experience and the human journey to ask really hard questions like, why are we here? And what is the point of all of this? And maybe we came up with our own answers to that all along. Maybe there is some ultimate truth out there that we're still circling around and we'll find out one day, Mm -hmm. Um, which is why I I do try to cling to that agnostic label because I I don't want to become so closed off in now, you know, the flip side of my beliefs and say, nope, absolutely not. There cannot be a God. Like, Mm -hmm. well, maybe there is something. I don't know. (laughs) Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't actually solved the mysteries of the universe. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well then why are we even having this conversation <laughs> um no I mean there is there is arrogance everywhere in terms of different <laughs> beliefs and you know mm. there is arrogance in every belief system and non-belief system um mm. and I think as soon as we sit on any end of any spectrum it that's when it becomes an issue that's when it becomes dangerous mm-hmm. Um, One of the things I would say I cling to now or worship would be the wrong word, but value strongly is curiosity. Humble curiosity has become a catchphrase of mine. Um, Remaining humble and not thinking I've got it all figured out. I'm 38 years old. I have not arrived. Um, 
and staying curious and continuing to learn and grow and ask questions and not be afraid of, you know, pulling on some of these threads. Yeah. And I think curiosity is one of the things that I have found most freeing about deconstructing because it is anything but black and white, which is often mm-hmm. what you are, you know, taught is very sort of um, this or that right, wrong, um, mm-hmm. very binary thinking. And so just to be even able to step outside of that and, mm-hmm. you know, see the many shades of grey and colours mm-hmm. in between black and white is equally daunting as it is freeing. Mm-hmm right yeah it's intimidating yeah Yeah. black and white is so comforting yeah and you can feel certain in your rightness Mm. you know well if it's this or that I'm this that's the right answer so I'm good Mm. if it's all murky and unknown well I don't know am I right am I wrong am I you know it's it leaves a lot of room to doubt yourself or you know not be certain and that can be a space of beautiful creativity but it can also be very scary because you could be totally barking up the wrong tree <laughs> yeah if it's not a clear cut yes or no right or wrong answer yeah are there moments where you go oh shit what if what if I'm wrong like what if <laughs> I've just like jumped down this rabbit hole and I am wrong I do laugh thinking because 15 year ago me would have never thought I would be yeah. an agnostic atheist ever in a million yeah. years. So 15 years from now, me, I like to joke I could be a fundamentalist. <laughs> back who in knows? A, a cult. I don't know. I doubt it. But uh, so who knows? You know, I don't know. I doubt. I don't know. No one can predict the future. I doubt I would turn back into a classical Christianity. I would lean, I'm assuming, if anything, I would go into a mystical approach to mm. any kind of religious beliefs. Um, one thing that has given me great comfort in thinking, what if I am wrong and God's out there watching and mm. seeing my book and not happy? Um, yeah. It has been learning about near-death experiences. Mm. I did some reading on those um, and they are universally positive mm. and no matter if the person having one was an atheist, was any kind of religion there is, if they were trying to end their own life, they Mm. all had, you know, 90 plus percent of the time, very similar experiences. There's kind of like 12 common experiences people have. And so not everybody has all 12, but somebody will have these four, somebody else, these six pieces of the near death experience package. Um, And they're overwhelmingly good. People feel a sense of that oneness of just deep ultimate love or peace the white light is, you know, part of that and out of body experience. And so to think, okay, these atheists are having those experience. These mobsters are having that experience. You know, people living what I would have judged as really evil, harmful lives had that same experience of being loved and at one and all is right. Yeah. So that gives me peace thinking if there is something, um, cause some of those stories are pretty bananas. There is one I read about that the woman was, she was a kayaker river kayaker and had gone over some rapids and her kayak got stuck on you know flipped and she could not the what the water was pushing her so strongly she could not flip it back over she was underwater for over half an hour she was bloated and blue and somehow was resuscitated so her brain like she was dead there's no no oxygen that unless she adapted gills really fast or something you know i don't know so to think it because I, you could say, well, near death, maybe our brains go through a last, you know, firing of all the neurons. And that's why we have these. But there are people that are brain dead and have yeah. these experiences. Um, and they're so mysterious, right? Like the out of body stuff is kind of wild to hear about. People see things on other wards of the hospital, or other units. Mm. How are they seeing? Their eyeballs are in a different room, taped shut in surgery. And they're seeing, quote unquote, things or hearing things. So it's just very mysterious and consciousness is mysterious. I'm still reading and learning about that. And there's a lot we don't know, but it mm-hmm. seems like if there is something, everybody seems to have this great universally lovely, good experience when yeah. they are near death. So I'm, that gives me hope to think, okay, if, mm-hmm. if I've barked up the wrong tree, it doesn't seem to be limited to this Christian God. Yeah, um, We all seem to be 
good to go. <laughs> Nobody's seen any flames. <laughs> no, and the people that say their experience was bad, it was just because it was scary. Like yeah. the life review freaked them out or the out of body floating sensation was scary, but mm. it's not because they saw flames and yeah. And you know, welcome to hell signs. Yeah. <laughs> Oh goodness. Um and so I you mentioned you've mentioned a couple of times I guess you know we in Australia look at the US and I go that is a shit show over there like in mm-hmm. terms of the enmeshment of Christian mm-hmm. nationalism in literally everywhere. Yep. And so how do you look at that now versus how you would have 15 years ago when you were one of those Christians? Yeah, I was never one of those Christians <laughs> for long, I was going to say. As uh, soon as I, uh, when I was young and I was in high school, mm. um, I would have called myself a Republican knowing nothing about what that meant. Yeah. And I, the first time I could vote when I turned 18, I did vote for George Bush again, having done zero research and just having gleaned Mm. from the atmosphere that Christians are Republicans. So you vote for Bush or whoever the Republican nominee is. Um, As soon as I started paying any attention, I've been a Democrat ever since and on the more liberal and progressive side of things. And there's a lot of Christians like that. So I, I think some of those conversations get very black and white where it's like, all Christians are these conservative, you know, gay haters and yeah. anti-science. And that's not true. There are plenty of progressive, kind, loving, inclusive Christians. They exist. And I was one of them for a long time. Yeah. Um, but seeing that political climate and how enmeshed it is in Christianity mm-hmm. is just so disheartening. Because I do still think Christianity can have a lot to offer. You know, again, it made my life good. And yeah. it gave me a lot of values that I appreciate. Um, but culturally, it is so warped and it's gotten so commandeered, you know, by the political nature of it. And that's been intentional. You know, it's really depressing to read about how concerted efforts have made it the way it is now. Mm. Uh, it didn't just happen by chance. You know, it was always a piece of white supremacy and a piece of keeping the power and keeping others subjugated and under. So it's hard not to get really bitter and jaded about all that. Um, but I had always been, when I was in that boat, still able to separate religion from God. Mm. To me, of course, religion was corrupt and messed up. Humans ran institutions of church. So mm. yeah, they're messed up, but God doesn't isn't part of that and you know they have it wrong kind of thing so i can still see that that the institutions of faith and the religious right and some of that stuff i wouldn't even call that a religion anymore you know it has become this political entity really um and so yeah it's its own whole monster but to Mm. me it really doesn't count as like a (laughs) a spiritual practice or belief system it's something different and quite Mm. ugly unfortunately and yeah powerful yeah it has become like you said its own entity um Mm -hmm. but i mean you know i will often say to people you know i'm not anti-god i'm not pro-god i'm Mm -hmm. anti-fundamentalist and i'm Mm anti-harm and um, I don't have a freaking clue what I believe, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, like you said a couple of times already, which is that there are, you know, the teachings of Jesus, for instance, are not inherently bad in any mm-hmm. way. And so um, are there parts of your former belief that you still hold dear without, I guess, the the concept of the divine over the top of that yeah I think a lot of the values that I have which are predominantly empathetic and social justice oriented I got from the prophets and from Jesus and the beatitudes and so yeah those remain true for me and are still the way I want to be human and show up in this world again it's just the motivation is different it's not 
doing that to please God. It's doing that because I think that's a way to be a good human <laughs> and both make the most of my life and this random experience of consciousness I get to have while recognizing that my success is tied up in everyone else's success and that I owe it to the human family to try to relieve suffering where I can, not to get brownie points for salvation, but just because we are part of a human family. And again, learning about evolution and realizing how wimpy and vulnerable our species is that we only have survived this long because yeah. of each other and yeah. because we work together or have um, motivates me to, yeah, to do whatever small bit I can. And that gets so overwhelming because mm. we're so globally aware of all these problems that I have zero influence over. Yeah. Um, but trying to focus on what I can influence and what my sphere does touch and, and mm. just do what good I can there. But yeah, I definitely... It's interesting about it, Jesus because I've since finishing my book read a really fascinating book on the historical anthropological figure of Jesus that kind oh. of really threw because I was still clinging to a lot of that was a harder thing for me to process for like if God isn't real then what is Jesus all about mm. um, it was Reza Aslan's book Zealot and he makes a pretty strong case that Jesus was truly a Jewish Messiah, one of many messiahs seemed to spring up every other year back in that day. Yeah. And that wasn't a huge claim for a person to make. There was countless messiahs at the Roman Empire continually executed. And it was a political role. He was concerned about Jewish liberation. They were an occupied people. Um, and that a lot of the more universal Christ, savior of all, is really Paul's brainchild. Mm. And that Paul kind of formulated a lot of that Paul or I guess it wasn't all Paul because John the book of John yeah. I am the word and the word was with God and the word was before God but those aren't Jesus saying that that's somebody right. else so it's like they took this person who was clearly captivating and got a lot of people's attention and seems to have a very loving inclusive progressive point of view with treatment of foreigners and women all that stuff um, kind of took it and ran with it and turned it into something else. And I'm okay with that now as a Christian, that would have freaked me out. Yeah. But now I'm like, okay, if it's all Paul, well, Paul had some cool ideas. And if Paul is the L. Ron Hubbard of Christianity and just mm. came up with this on his own, neat. Like there's yeah. Paul's been misinterpreted and a lot of bad stuff came out of that too. But um, yeah, the I can just see it looking at religion as a human construct mm. to me opens it up to make it much easier for me to be able to just take the good out of it without having to put the importance of my soul and eternity on it all. So I can just say like, okay, I can see how maybe this was all just his little philosophical brainchild. And, mm. but I like that. And I like this, just like I like Taoism and I've been reading the Tao Te Ching and I've been reading Rumi and, there's a lot of good in a lot of different faiths and I can more easily see that kind of like from an objective outsider and just pull out the parts that call to me and that I like. Mm. What was it like for you when you finally finished writing your book? <laughs> it was so clarifying. I mean, it was such a good experience. I've been saying it's kind of funny to think in the past the process of writing the book, I was in a flow state a lot of the time. It poured out of me and I would have accredited the Holy Spirit to that before and said mm. the Spirit was speaking through me because the book just, I mean, every time the kids went down for a nap, the minute after bedtime, I was on the computer and it just, I didn't have writer's block at all. It just literally poured out. Yeah. Um, so it was a unique experience of feeling like some from from using my body as a conduit, you know. Um, it was my story, and I think it just needed to come out. Um, so, yeah, the the process of writing, it was very clarifying and therapeutic and helpful for me to write because I was writing it. I started writing it almost immediately after first saying, like, I don't think God's real pretty mm -hmm. early because I had I had a blog at the time, and I had tried to blog about this because I had blogged about spirituality and politics and all kinds of stuff. And every time I started the blog – there was just too much to say. I, thought, I don't know where to start. I don't know how to package this. And so that's what made me think, gosh, I, I think there's enough. If I go into the backstory and explain how I got here, I think there's enough for a whole book. Mm. Um, so it happened pretty instantaneously. So the whole second half of the book, when I have walked away from faith and I'm now asking 
who am I? And, you know, this massive identity crisis and processing the grief, writing all that was very helpful and clarifying for me to figure out who I, who I am and where do I find meaning now? And what does morality look like without God watching from the eaves and all of that? So it was very helpful. And um, yeah, I felt excited. I know. So the publishing world nowadays is totally popularity driven. You need to have 100,000 plus Instagram followers or Twitter yeah. followers. And I have nowhere near close to that. So I had very low hopes that it would get out there. I was planning to self-publish it. Mm. Um, but through Instagram, I met my publisher, who's a more small indie publishing house. And that's been great. And so it's been fun to have the book still not, you know, I'm not on any big bestseller list. It's not, you know, flying off the shelves, but people are finding it. And I've had people from around the world, you know, yourself and other countries reaching out. And so that's been really neat because that, that sense of loneliness was a big motivation of why I wrote the book. I thought, I felt alone. I know I'm not. I know there's got to be others like me who have gone down the same similar route. And if I can give them any sense of comfort or, you know, camaraderie, then that would be amazing. So to have been able to do that for even a few people has been just a gift. It's been really cool. I think I, I wonder if it's popularity with people is that, I've never read of another book like it, to be honest. The mm. the intersection of it being spiritual, emotional, intellectual, and personal of mm. those four intersections that, you know, in some books you only ever get one of those things, mm. to have all four of them in one book, I think there is almost something in there for everybody. Um, and I think that's really unique. Um, okay. In present day, what mm -hmm. brings you joy and peace? Mm. Um, being outside mm -hmm. brings me a lot of joy and peace. Uh, we live in a very pretty area of America where I'm up in the uh, upper north, the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. um, the upper left corner of the country is some okay. of our hashtag. And so it's very pretty. There's mountains nearby, a lot of evergreen forests and rivers and lakes, and it's beautiful. So I try to get outside as much as I can. I am a mom of young kids and I have a job, but uh, we try to go hiking and we do a lot of camping in the summer and try to get out. So being outside, I get to feel that sense of connection and, you know, looking around at everything and think, you are my distant relative. And so that's yeah. really fun. Um, I still get a lot of joy and awe from reading and learning. And so I've been picking up a lot more books, you know, and stretching my mind that way is exciting for me and gives me some encouragement that I haven't learned everything. There's still a lot of stuff out there that I can investigate and, and be challenged and stretched by. Yeah. Um, and then my kids, they're so cute. They're five and seven and they're just oh. at such fun ages with their imaginations and their personalities are really shining. And so trying mm -hmm. to lean into the present moment with them, knowing how fleeting it is and just having more, mm. trying to get more moments of connection and not just like wishing away the day to get to bedtime because it is exhausting at the same time, but to be yeah. there and to have the dance party in the kitchen and to let uh. them do my makeup and, you know. <laughs> To enjoy that as opposed to being like, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When is it bedtime? Uh, uh -huh. Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. I have been finishing all of these episodes by asking, asking, what would you say to someone who is fresh in their deconstruction? That thread has just started to unravel. Mm. I would wish them courage, mm. um, and also at the same time tell them that. They are not obligated to follow that thread. Mm. If they're happy living their life and don't want to rock the boat, no one's making them, you know, a placebo effect is still an effect. If their faith does something good in their life, keep going. You know, there's, you don't, not having any kind of religious belief has been so freeing for me, but to also see that, yeah, there is no impulse to do you know my life is literally just my life I mean I shouldn't be breaking the law but I can do whatever I want yeah <laughs> and so can you so 
if you like thinking about this and you need to find a sense of truth, uh, you know, by all means explore and take comfort knowing others have gone down the same path and their life didn't totally implode. Mm -hmm. Um, and that there's joy and peace on the other side. And for me, even more than I ever had in the faith. Um, but also I like to, yeah, just give people an out and say, you don't owe anybody anything. You don't have to answer these mysteries of the universe yourself. We are just tiny little humans here yeah. for a few decades. You get to live your life the way you choose. And if being religious is part of that, I, I wouldn't take that away from anybody and say that they are obligated to deconstruct. Um, but yeah, you do you. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I think I love that, that sense of like autonomy, almost self-autonomy. Mm -hmm. You just do what feels best for you. Uh, don't mm -hmm. hurt anyone. Just do what is best right. for you. Right. Yeah. Do no harm. Yeah. Go forth. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. love that. Thank you so much for joining me. Yes. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Beyond the Surface. I hope you found today's conversation as insightful and inspiring as I did. If you enjoyed the episode, be sure to subscribe, leave a review and share it with others who might benefit from these stories. Stay connected with us on social media for updates and more content. I love connecting with all of you. Remember, no matter where you are in your journey, you're not alone. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning and keep moving forward. Take care.